Welcome back, everybody. Today, we are back at the intersection, at the intersection of technology and culture. If you're someone who's in tech or you're some kind of creative or artist and you have interest in either side, this show is for you. I'm ex- particularly excited to interview Jason Ma, who has so many cool stories in his life from being on some street shit as a kid in the West Coast to becoming a youth pastor to teaching a hip hop Bible class to being mentored by MC Hammer while they traverse the tech space in Silicon Valley. Jason is the co-founder of 88 Rising, the iconic Asian music and media brand whose artist songs created a ton of memorable moments for me as a teenager. Iji Ma with Keith Bape, that stick with Rich Ryan, the higher brothers made in China. I used to listen to that doing work in the office all the time. All bring back these like distinct high school memories for me. Jason is also the co-founder of Open a Web3 super app with the goal of onboarding all of us from Web2 to Web3. Jason himself, like I said, is at the intersection of tech and culture, East and West, and he's on a mission to represent Asian culture the right way in mainstream media, entertainment, and technology. Jason, welcome to the intersection. Thanks for having me, Matt. Glad to be on here. I would love for you to just tell us a little bit about your like growing up story, trying to be a rapper, a youth pastor, MC Hammer, all that stuff. <laughs> what part do you want to know? <laughs> whatever whatever uh come comes to mind um we can go from whatever whatever pops out yeah i mean um so you know i was born in lubbock texas um that's where i was born but i was only there for like a year and that's home to texas tech but it's also home to the church of christ which is a major christian denomination um that brought my parents, my dad specifically, to America as a first-generation immigrant. And so they sponsored him. They own Pepperdine University. So that's where my mom and my dad went to university. And then after uh, they graduated, they went to Lubbock to serve at the local uh, church. And that's where I was born. And so I kind of grew up with that. I don't know, what do you, what do you, what do you want to call it? But... Um, uh, immigrant mentality, uh, second second generation, of course. My mom used to tell me funny stories that we we're like the only Asian people in the whole city. So people used to drive up to our house to see what we look like. <laughs> Over <laughs> in Texas? <laughs> <laughs> like 1970s, you know. And so then my dad, um, he, he left uh, the ministry to go become an entrepreneur. He hmm. moved to San Jose, South Bay, 408. Um, that's where I grew up. Uh, so, you know, Bay area, NorCal. So you had Tri-City, you had San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, right? The 415, the 510, the 408. And so, you know, I grew up in a really, I would say a very unique and epic time period, meaning, Mm. um, you know, I was born in 1980. I'm 42 now. So, they call our generation, they call it extennial because it was like the last generation of Gen X, but the first generation of millennial. I know now there are Gen Z kids after 96. So I was 16. I was born in 2000. Well, there you go, right? What that means is I was born into analog, right? I was born into analog, but I experienced the disruption and evolution of digital, Mm. right? So I was born before computers, right? Um, or maybe, you know, the first IBM was already there in the in in in, in the seventies, but the personal it wasn't computer, around everywhere. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And so pre smartphones, you know, what I'm saying like when I grew up in junior high, it was pagers. You know, was, you guys, you kids don't even know what that is. It's a little paper <laughs> that would give you a message if you got a if you got a message from someone and then you would call them back. And then from there, flip phones and then from flip phones, smartphones and everything mm-hmm. we see here. But, you know, I grew up, you know, in the 80s and then I grew up in the 90s where it was just different. Um, you know, we grew up in West Coast, East Coast hip hop gang culture. You know, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm, this mm-hmm. is Tupac, this is Biggie, this is, you know, I call it the golden era of hip hop. So, you know, in the 80s growing up in the Bay Area, um, you know, we saw the rise of hip hop culture. We saw the rise of gang culture. We also saw the rise of Silicon Valley. Right. So it was mm-hmm. a lot of culture, but there was also a lot of tech all happening at the same time, mm-hmm. which was 
very, very unique if you were in the Bay Area, because I would say at that time, the Bay had a lot of culture. There was a lot of culture. Like if you went to San Francisco, Oakland, Haight Street, Mission, uh, you're in, you know, East Oakland, you know, whether it was gang culture, whether it was music culture, whether it was funk, whether it was hip hop, underground hip hop, whether it was drugs. And then at the same time, you had Silicon Valley and all these tech companies really becoming the disruptors of the world. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or it really became, you know, the controller of the planet as we know today. So you're talking about Apple springing up, you know what I'm saying? You're talking about semiconductor companies like Flextronics and, 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 and Siemens. But then at the same time, you started seeing the dot-com boom at the late 90s, early 2000s. And this is even before Facebook, you know, I'm talking about like before social media, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it was very interesting growing up. It was very interesting growing up. So, you know, Growing up as an Asian kid in East San Jose, I got kicked out of three high schools, ended up at four. Um, you know, I was just a troublemaker. I, I wouldn't uh -huh. say that I was a gang member, but I would say that I had a lot of friends that were gang members. You were outside. You were, you were in I was, I was gang, I was gang adjacent, right? I was just like, these, these are my friends in the neighborhood, right? And uh, <laughs> I was always like, I was always like, I want to be black. I want to be a rapper. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, like, like my eighth grade, you know, my, I remember my, really, my you would eighth... think that often, sorry, not to cut you off, but that was, that would be something as a kid you would think about a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. I mean, like me and my next door neighbor, funny enough, um, he was, uh, Spanish and, 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 and we would just grow up on MTV raps, which was a TV, TV show on MTV. And then, um, and then there was uh, BET, of course, Black Entertainment Television. And they would just roll real – it was just like YouTube before YouTube, right? So it was just like rolling rap videos all day long, right? And you're just watching like, yo, did you see that? Who was that? It was Black Moon? What? Black Sheep? Who's that? Lords of the Underground? Who's that? Help the Skelta? Like, the Toys B.I.G.? Wu Tang Clan, like you know what I'm saying? Like it was just like this mm. whole like amazing magical music culture that came out mm. of nowhere and it had so much swag and style and everybody was just so cool and you were just like mesmerized. So like literally hip hop was my religion. So we would just after school watch BET rap videos, watch MTV, and then we would roll out, you know, linoleum and like backspin and windmill and just like break dance right so it was like hip-hop was our religion hip-hop was our life hip-hop was our culture and so mm -hmm. growing up with that you had east coast which was really like conscious underground you know uh verbal you know mm -hmm, rap mm -hmm. styles and strategies whereas the west coast was nwa it was you know what i'm saying it was dre it was snoop it was e40 in the bay it was too short it was a lot more gang culture rap it was a lot more pimp culture rap and so you kind of grew up with a lot of a lot of both right and so i loved it all mm -hmm. right? i was deep in underground hip-hop so i really loved and this is before anyone of y'all even know what i'm talking about but freestyle fellowship uh living legends mystic journeyman hieroglyphics far side like they were like the underground conscious rappers of the west coast and they were mm -hmm. heavily Jazz influence and influenced by the rock chems and influenced, you know, by you know the top MCs out in the East Coast. So, anyways, all that being said, I was living this life where I was deep in underground West Coast rap, hip hop culture, sneaking out of my house at 13, 14, 15 years old, jumping out my window so I could go to downtown San Jose <laughs> to go join the rap battles that would happen every Thursday night. Right at 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 Plan B in in downtown San Jose, so that was like my eight mile, like literally, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mile, mm -hmm. right. And it was like everybody was, it was just a crazy scene. On the other side of that, I had um, you know my Vietnamese, Cambodian, 
South Asian gang friends. <laughs> and, you know, they were <laughs> robbing things. They were robbing everything. You know, they were breaking into everything. They were beating up everything. Like, they were shooting everything. And so, <laughs> those, were, those were my homies, right? So I literally, at school, I had, like, two groups of friends. I would, you know, hang out with my hip-hop friends, and we would be ciphering and freestyling and breakdancing, mm-hmm. and I would hang out with my Southeast Asian gang friends who would be smoking dope, dealing dope, breaking and entering, and just getting all kinds of problems and gang fights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At the Those same are time, unique to the West Coast. Like, it is very unique. Yeah, yeah. It was very unique. Yeah, it was very unique. And, yeah, and at the same time, I'm just seeing the boom of Silicon Valley and, you know, my friends – you know, parents working as engineers in, you know, some semiconductor chip company, some microsystems, flextronics and whatnot. So it was really interesting. So long story short is I grew up on the other side of the hood. Um, my mom didn't want me to go to jail and get in trouble. So after eighth grade, I was getting in so much trouble. She sent me to the west side of, of, of San Jose, which was Cupertino, which was um, basically like Bel Air. Like it was like the Asian Bel Air, Beverly Hills, like. Rich kids, everyone went to Stanford or MIT or Harvard. There was no gangs, no drugs. Like, and I was just like, I stuck out like a sore thumb. And I was like, you guys are all whack. You guys are all stupid. And, <laughs> <laughs> so I got in a gang fight my first six months. I kicked out of Limbrook. Then I started dealing weed at my next high school, Cupertino High. That got found out. So I got kicked out of there. And I'm like, yo, I got to get out of this place. It's super horrible. These kids are just stupid and ignorant and dumb. Like, get me back to where I came from, which was like the hood. So they sent me back to Independence High School on the east side, which is like gangland. <laughs> it's like literally like The Wired, but like like the TV series, but like in a high school, it's like 5,000 school kids that used to be a junior wow, college. Big. Oh yeah. And it was like, you know, Mexicans fighting the Filipinos, Vietnamese fighting the Filipinos, v- Vietnamese Filipinos fighting the Mexicans. Like it was just crazy. Like every That's day so was a full blown war. Like I used to carry, you know, a knife with me or bare knuck, uh, brass knuckles, you know, at in your me backpack at all times in my backpack, in my pocket, just like, didn't know if I was going to get stabbed. Like it was crazy. And so anyways, so I was at independence for two years and then, um, and then, uh, and then I had, you know, I had a brush with death. We got, we got into a gang fight, um, with my neighborhood homies. And, um, I still remember the gang was called CWA, Cambodians with Attitude. So they, they were <laughs> NWA, but they were CWA. And these kids were like, times our size. They had like, I remember they had bats, they had machetes. It was like 20 of them. They were like out of school, dropped out. And it was like seven of us. And then like, they were ready to throw down. And then the cops come, break up the fight. And I remember having my first encounter with God. I was like... Like, this dude was like, you know, are you Flicktown? That's where I was living, in Flickinger Park. And then we had a gang there called Flicktown. And he was like, you Flicktown? And then me and my friends were like, yeah, what's up? And inside, I was like, damn, I'm going to die. <laughs> like, this guy's going to cut my throat. But we were, like, ready. And then um, I just remember saying a prayer. I was like, God, you know, if you're up there, give me a second chance. And I kid you not, like, seconds later, I just hear it. It wasn't like a real cop, you know, we call them narcs. They're the cops on campus, right? And it's like, whoop, whoop. They're coming like a little golf cart. And then everyone's like, oh shit, break. And then so everyone runs. And I'm just thinking to myself, oh my God, like, did God hear my prayer? Like, I could have been, you know, I could have been seriously hurt. And I kind of forgot about it. And then I got transferred from that school to Piedmont Hills High, which is a little bit better, but not that much better. Um, it, was, it was probably the best school in the district. And then that's where I found Jesus. That's where I found Christ. You know, I was on my way to jail for grand theft. And uh, I don't want to oh, get yeah. to Because of the, the suits. The right? suits. That's right. Uh, yeah. There's yeah. so much to your story. Yeah. Well, there's no way we could cover it all in this hour. So I'll let you keep going to what you think are the important parts. But it's all so interesting. Yeah, I mean, long story short, you know, I turned myself in, you know, grand theft, had two strikes against me. I was 17 going on 18. Would have went to juvenile hall, then they would have transferred me to most likely San Quentin or a major penitentiary uh, for a few years for because I'd stolen hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of stuff. And even though I confessed guilty to everything, and I was the only one of the three of us that confessed honestly to what happened, um, my other two friends got arrested. And long story short, they lost my court case for six months. When I finally went to my case in court, they postponed it twice. And on the third time, 
the judge and the jury did, decided to, to let me go free. And, um, wow, yeah. and, and basically said, you're not guilty, even though I pleaded guilty, um, which is a miracle. You know, I, I still yeah. look back, you know, 25 years later, That's like wild. God is good. So anyway, so that was my journey. So from there I was like, you know, God, you're the nicest dude I ever met in my life. <laughs> I'm going to get in the passenger seat. Jesus, you take the driver's seat. You know, you take me wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And, you know, that was it. And I, I didn't really know, like, what skill I had. I just knew I was just a street kid that was constantly hustling, you know, selling drugs from weed to shrooms to $5 candy sticks, you know, at the gas station, <laughs> body lotion at the mall. To, That's you know, so I, funny. Like, huh? whatever. I was always selling something, right? I was always hustling and selling. So I was like, you know, God, like, if you can use my mouth, if you could use me in any way, you know, please do. And then that is where I became, I started hip hop Bible study, I became a youth pastor, I started preaching. And then that led me to meet MC Hammer. Hammer introduced me to the culture, meaning hip hop, the industry, the music business, the entertainment business. But then he also introduced me to tech because he was the first celebrity to get involved in technology in Silicon Valley and venture capital. Cause that's incredible. Film. Like yeah. one of the most fascinating things about your story with MC Hammer to me is how ridiculously ahead of the tech game he was. Like I feel if only people knew how much insight MC Hammer da, 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 can't touch this has into tech, I think they'd look at him completely different. Yeah, not a lot of people know. I think after you know his whole you know career and you know from the highs and lows, he was kind of like I'm done with the music industry, I'm done with Hollywood. I don't want to, it's like evil. Like it's just smoke and mirrors. I don't want to touch it. So I, I think he wanted to really just lay low, build, do the work, invest. And it's obviously proven to work for him in a very, very amazing way. Um, so yeah, so we, you know, I remember I was his, you know, I was his, I was his assistant. Like I, I would wipe his kids diapers, take him to the baseball game and then wow. at the same time, drive him to a place called Twitter. Right. When it was three people. Oh, wow, yeah. Right. That's He's like, we're going to meet so the startup called Twitter. Right. And they're doing like forums on on on, on online and um, drove him to YouTube when it was five people above Pizza Parlor in San Mateo. Um, he was like, Jason, there's a new company called YouTube. They're uploading content to servers. <laughs> <laughs> Wild. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> Salesforce when it was less than 100. We were wow. at. Wow. Airbnb, Uber, all that, like before it was even Airbnb and Uber. So it was like we saw it all and we were there. Mm -hmm. The first celebrity that was, you know, you're in the Bay. Hammer's like a demigod. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like he's really the, you know, he's the biggest celebrity that ever came out of the Bay, right? Really? When it comes to the music. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, you could wow. say 2 short, you could say E40, but, you know, Hammer just went to a whole nother level, right? You're talking about like, selling 10 million albums, the first rap artist to send 10 million albums and go diamond and win, you know, American Music Awards and the Grammys and this, that, and the third and have the commercial and perform at the Super Bowl. You know, like Hammer at his height was like bigger than anyone you know today. He was as big as Taylor Swift at that time. Really? And so, well, I didn't even realize. Yeah. So it was just like, you know, every single tech company was like, every CEO was like some, you know, <laughs> some MIT Stanford nerd. Like, I can meet MC <laughs> Like, MC Hammer wants to come meet me? Of course I'll come Hammer. And so anyway, so that's how, you know, I started learning about, you know, Web 1, the Web 2, now Web 3. So very interesting. And that's kind of just my backstory of, you know, where I grew up and how it all happened. Wow. Wow. Um, and then you ended up getting in, getting into music. And at one point you paid Bruno Mars only 1.5K for to record four tracks with you. Yeah, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was crazy. What uh can you tell us about that? Um yeah, I mean, so you know, I was I was, you know, I ended up becoming a missionary uh, for five plus years in forty countries and um long story short, you know, I had this moment where, you know, I felt like God was calling me to go do uh third world mission work. And so Hammer gave me the blessing after working with him for about five plus years in venture capital and you know, building a record label and record label and all this. And um, I just thought tech, music, 
entertainment movies like that was just the devil. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to I'm not going to touch Hollywood. I'm not going to touch money. I'm just going to do God's work. And um, mm-hmm. and uh, it's actually a really kind of crazy um, story I'll share here. Um, so I was basically burned out. I was out in the mission field and I was just you know going to a different third world country and city every two weeks preaching, casting out devils, healing the sick, preaching the gospel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, on the exorcism tip. And um, <laughs> and I was just like, man, I need a break. Like, I really need a break. Like, this is way too intense. Um, so I, I checked myself into, like, the spiritual retreat center. It's kind of like a Christian rehab. And um, when I was there, like, kind of recharging, restoring for two weeks, um, the last five nights I had five dreams. And I had five dreams, five nights in a row, and each dream, a different rap icon would come up to me and be like, I'm going to sign you to be a gospel rap artist. And I was like, <laughs> so the first night was Dr. Dre. Um, uh, I remember it was, it was, yeah, it was Dr. Dre. And then um, the second night was Diddy. The third night was Will Smith. Fourth night was Hammer. And the fifth night was Eminem. And they were it's all like Christmas Carol. It's like your it Uncle like Scrooge, Carol. but <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was like pretty much the same dream. Like, hey, you want to sign you as a gospel rap artist? And I'm like, what? Me? It was Asian kid? Like, what? <laughs> and, and then, you know, you have one dream, you're like, whatever. Two dreams, you're like, that's weird. Three dreams, you're like, this is getting really funny, right? So when you have five dreams in a row, it's basically the same message. Like, I basically went to this counselor, this pastor uh, that was mentoring me. I was like, what do you think this all means? And he was like, maybe God's calling you to get back into music, right? And, you know, when I was in high school, I made my first mixtape. I had a little underground hip-hop mixtape that I made. Um, One was just, like, funny Asian rap songs, and another one was, like, me battle rapping. And then um, let that go, forgot about it, and I was like, I haven't done that in years. And he's like... I don't know, man. Just do it if that's what God's telling you to do. So I went back to L.A. and I found this worship leader at this Asian American church. His name was Mike Wang. And um, he he just started playing with Cubase and like GarageBand at the time, uh, which was like before Logic and Pro Tools. Right. And he was like, yeah, I can actually record on my laptop. He's like, I could just make some beats and you could rap and I can, you know, play the music. And I was I can see yep, yep. this is like when Lincoln Park was the shit, right? And so I was like, yo, let's make like Christian Lincoln Park. And so <laughs> so I would rap, he would sing, and then we made this album. It was called Namesake. And then, um, <laughs> and so I didn't know what to do with it. I had this album and I'm just like, you know, sent it to like my, my college, you know, ministry students and giving out at conferences I was preaching at. And then, um, and I gave it to my one friend. She was the only friend I knew in Hollywood that was an actress. Uh, her name is Kathy. She's now the biggest actress in Vietnam, a Korean, a Vietnamese American actress. And she was like listening to it. She was like, "Hey, this kind of, this kind of, this kind of good." She's like, "You should meet my friend. He uh, manages, you know, um, these Asian American rap artists." And I was like, "Asian American rap artists?" I was like, "Who?" And then she was like, oh, "This rap group called Far East Movement. They're like Asian Beastie Boys." And I was like, "Who's that?" And then she was like, and this other rapper named Jen, um, she said, remember the battle rapper that, you know, got signed to DMX? I'm like, Jen? Of course, Jen the MC. I was like, what happened to him? She goes, you know, I don't know. He got dropped or something. And then my friend signed him. And I was like, who's your friend? She goes, oh, he runs all the Asian nightclubs, blah, 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 in LA. I'm like, which ones? And she was like, yada, yada, da. I'm like, wait a second. I know those nightclubs. I know that group. I'm like, that's triad. That's like Asian mafia. <laughs> she was like, yeah, 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 he used to be in the triads. He used to be like a triad gang leader. And I was like, okay, why would he want a gospel rap album? And she was like, just, I don't know. I mean, just give it to him. And I was like, nah, he's not going to want to listen to this. She's like, just give it to me and let me give it to him. So I give her a copy of my physical CD, forget about it for a month. And then, um, a month later, <laughs> um, uh, maybe a few months later, I get this text message one morning. And she's like, hey, you want to go meet my friend? He, The guy I told you about, the man, geez, these rappers, he wants to meet with you. And I was like, word? Okay. So I go, I still remember, it was downtown LA, California Pizza Kitchen. 
and her this you know this former triad boss now hip hop Asian American rapper manager. He's sitting there, shades like he had a tiger tattoo. Like it was like the whole it was like a movie. Like he was sitting there and he was sounds like, like a movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was like, "Yo, so what do you do?" And I was like, <laughs> "I'm a youth pastor." <laughs> and he's like, "What?" He's like, "I thought you're a rapper." I was like, uh, I mean, it's like rap for God. Yeah, like I do gospel rap or whatever you want to call it. And he was like, oh, that's crazy. He's like, you know what? You know, before we start this conversation, I just want to make a quick disclaimer. He was like, actually, my dad's a pastor and my grandfather's a pastor. And he was like, but I've been to every church in L.A., the church. I think it's all full of hypocrites and organized religion. I don't buy into all that. He's like, you know, I made my peace with God and, you know, don't try to convert me or tell me about Jesus or anything. All right. And I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, it's funny you say that. Cause you know, I don't think Jesus was about religion. Like he was about, mm-hmm, a religion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, me, you and my friend Kathy here talking about the big J upstairs right now, California pizza kitchen. We're having church right here. That's what the Bible right, says. Right, right, right. We gather, he's there with them. So he was like, what? So then I tell him my story, <laughs> testimony, and long story short, I prophesy and pray for him. He starts crying. He's freaking out. And then he like goes to the bathroom and he comes back out and he's freaking out. And then he's showing me his phone, which is a Blackberry at the time. And he was like, and the, and the alarm's going off and, the, and, and, and on the calendar, it says two o'clock church. He's like, look what it says on my phone. And I'm reading, it says church, two o'clock, and the alarm's going off. I'm like, why does it say church? He goes, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, what do you mean? He was like, I was supposed to look for a church location for our music video shoot with Far East Movement. We're having uh, in a few days, but they actually found the church location this morning. So that's why I was able to reschedule and have lunch with you right now. But it's two o'clock, and we're having church. And I was like, that's whoa. Wild. So fast forward, this goes to the Bruno Mars story. Um, I end up That's wild. baptizing him, Kev Nish, the leader of Far East Movement, who made the hit song Like a G6, and Jen in this dude's bathtub in the next 48 hours. He introduces me to all of them. I lead them all to Jesus. I baptize Wait, what? Them. You baptized Bruno Mars, the guy who made Like a G6 in some... Huh? Not Bruno oh, Mars. I didn't, I didn't baptize oh, okay. Bruno. I baptized... <laughs> Baptized, <laughs> who's the leader of Arts Movement? Right, right, right. Then the rapper, because they were both managed by this, 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 you know, this, this, this former mob boss who That's went right. to this California Pizza Kitchen with That's you, right. and then right. had this spiritual experience. That's right. That's right. That's so, so he introduced. Crazy. He was like, "You got to meet Kev Nish. You got to meet Jen." And they all happened to be in town, so I led them all to the Lord, and then I baptized them all in his bathtub, and I was like, "Yo, God has a plan." And I was like, you know, we're going to be soldiers of light and we're going to bridge east and west. We're going to do it through music. We're going to be the Asian death jam. And so I basically invested um, uh, almost a million dollars in the company before it was about to go bankrupt. And then um, and then Kev Nish from Forest Moon was assigned to produce my album. So he was like one night we're in the studio at the office, actually. And he was like, yo, Jay, you know, we listened to you your gospel album and it's you know it's i it's 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 good but it's it's not great <laughs> and they're like they're like you know you're not you're not you're not jay-z you know you're not you know you're asian you're not cypress hill and they're like we don't know what to do with you and then he was kind of like but you know what man when you pray for us it's so powerful he's like you ever thought about just like praying or like preaching over the beat and i was like what do you mean? Like talking? And he was like, yeah. I was like, how would I do that? He was like, do you have any of your sermons on YouTube? And I was like, yeah, I got a ton of them. You know, he was like, why don't you play your sermon over a beat? And the other night, the night before this guy named Charles Jones, who used to be the keyboard player for like Jewel and all these other big artists, Tony, 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 he like emailed me out of the blue and said, the Holy Spirit told me to give you this beat. And you're supposed to make a song on this beat that's going to change the world or something like that. I was like, huh, what? So he gave me this beat and it was a dope beat. It was just like this simple, like, you know, hip hop beat. And Kev was like, yo, why don't you play one of your sermons over that beat that your friend sent you and just see what happens? 
So I played my sermon, played the beat, played my sermon at the same time, and it landed in this crazy cadence. And he was just like, yo, oh, my God. And Kev was like, yo, look at my hair standing up. Oh, my God. He was like, yo, this is crazy, man. You sound like Joel Osteen meets Eminem, like smashed into one. (laughs) Like, what? And he was like, yo, can you just preach over anything? And I was like, yeah, man, I've been preaching for five years straight, like every day in 40 countries. And he was like, yo, we got to get you the studio. So you know how they say, like in uh, that book Outliers, with Malcolm Gladwell, like if you want to be a master at anything, you got to spend ten thousand hours doing one thing. And I had no idea. I always say, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. I had no idea that me preaching ten thousand hours would lead me <laughs> to becoming a hip hop artist, right? That was <laughs> my special style, right? And so I go into the studio, and he's like, "Yo, why don't you just like preach about love?" Like God's love. And I was like, all right. So I go in the studio, drop the beat, and I just drop three verses, 16 bars each, one take. Like freestyle. Like no written, off the top of my dome. Off the top. Like, wow, interesting. Yeah, just like out of my spirit, right? Because I knew how to I could preach. I could preach circles around anybody. And then so off the top about love onto a beat. That's exactly. so funny. So it lands, and he's just like, yo, this is crazy. This sounds like Eminem. And he was like, yo, we got to get someone to sing on the hook to make it less religious. So it feels like a pop <laughs> track, you know? Like something they could play on the radio and sing along to. And I was like, all right. I was like, who do you got? And he was like, um, man, I know somebody. He's, he's our Filipino brother. He writes for us, and I'm pretty sure he needs the money. He just got dropped. I think it was by Motown at the time or something like that. And I was like, what's his name? And he's like, his name's Bruno Mars. And I was like, who's Bruno Mars? And he was like, yo, this guy sounds, he can sing like Michael Jackson. I kid you not. And he was like, check out his MySpace. Wow. So this was when MySpace was the shit. And I go to Bruno Mars' MySpace and I'm listening to his tracks. And I'm like, dude, this guy sounds like MJ. That like, His voice is crazy. I was like, how much? He's like, let me call him. You like him? Let me call him. So Kev calls him up. Hangs up and is like, yo, Bruno's in. I got a crazy deal for you, man. He was like, he'll he'll write and record for you four tracks, whole package. I was like, how much? He was like, 1500 Wow. I was like, done. <laughs> so I take out my Wells Fargo check, $1,500 to Bruno Mars. I still have the check stub. And he came into the studio and laced – all four tracks, all four hooks, wrote it, recorded it, boom. Like it was like one session or two sessions. I forgot. It was like nothing for him. So I get back to demos and I'm like, yo, this sounds so good. Like, why would I want someone else to re-sing this? I'm just going to keep it with Bruno. So we had this song called Love. It was basically a song about the gospel, <laughs> that Jesus loves you, with me freestyle preaching and Bruno Mars. And then um, it was like 2009, then 10, I think. I drop it on Amazon Music and it immediately hits top 10 on the gospel charts. And then it gets like millions of views on YouTube. And it just blows up. And I'm just like, what? And then about six months later, uh, our company signs for its movement to Interscope and Jimmy Iovine wow. after, after like a G6 hits. And then that sold like 15 million records and goes number one. That was the biggest song of the year. And then Jin, we sent we send on a one way ticket to Hong Kong with Universal Music, and he blows up and he becomes the biggest rapper today in China. Uh, biggest Interesting. rapper. Wow. And and he goes gold uh, and he just blows up and starts getting like a hundred brand deals. It was crazy. And then um, of course Bruno, the rest is history. You know, he got signed to Atlantic like less than you know months later and wow. uh then nothing on you comes out uh billionaire on and on and on and and, and just the way you are in the album the whole thing and so anyway so that was just like this very interesting moment where our little company it's called pca at the time and i had a, a company called adventures.tv which is a company i raised money for um where i put about a million bucks into and i had a vision at the time that there would be a digital i had a dream actually could you not? So I had a dream one night. It was like in 2008 and 
I had this dream where I saw all my friends, meaning like far as movement, Jen and everybody have their own YouTube shows on YouTube. Kid you not now, bro. This is 2008, right? This is like when YouTube had just started coming out, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. I, had, I saw it very clearly. It was like a YouTube page and like Far East Movement had a show. Jen, like all these different artists, all my friends had a show. And I remember telling our illustrator, our designer in-house, like design it for me. And so he like drew out this whole thing and I called it Adventures uh, uh, ADVN, Adventures Digital uh, network. And I wanted to create a digital Asian music content media network. So mm-hmm. this is pre 88 rising. Mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, we're going to create a digital channel online on YouTube with Asian artists and Asian creators and Asian, you know, musicians just making their own content. And we're talking to be curated as one channel, like a digital, you know, BET for Asians. And, um, mm-hmm. So after I left that company, uh, I started another company, which is now East West Ventures, which is my fund. Um, and we we're bridging artists from Asia into Hollywood and artists mm-hmm. from Hollywood into Asia. And we started representing over 100 major you know, Asian artists that had literally combined hundreds of millions of followers. And I was like, why don't mm-hmm. we set up our own Asian digital channel on YouTube? And this is now 2015, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And, and that's when I saw, you know, there was Vice Media, there was Taste Made, there was yeah, Bot, yeah, yeah. And Digital. And I was like, yo, what about Asians? And so uh, a friend of mine, Tony, introduced me to this guy, Alan Debevoir, who was a VC investor in all these YouTube digital channels. So he invested in Machinima and then he invested in like, I don't know, it was Interesting. Drama wow, wow. And it was all that time when it was all blown up, 2013. Right, 14. right, 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 right. I was like, yo, what about like middle school? Yeah. And when I was in like early high school, I was like 15, like 14, 15, 16, when this was all blowing. I remember this stuff very vividly. This is crazy. So I was asked, I was like, yo, what about an Asian YouTube channel? And he was like, yo, man, he was like, if you build the business plan and you bring together the team, I'll write the first check. And he didn't say, yo, man, but I was like, me uh, paraphrasing, but <laughs> like this Jewish guy. <laughs> He's like, hey, man, you know, you put together the team yeah, yeah. and yeah, I'll, I'll write you the first check. So he literally gave me a term sheet for $1.3 million of a $2.5 million raise. Um, and I was like, how am I going to you know, put this all together? And so my friend, Justin Chan, who's now a famous director that recently uh, directed Pachenko on Apple, Apple Plus, I was managing him at the time. He's like, yo, you got to meet my friend, Sean. He's at Vice Media. He's like the guy you need to hire and work together with to, to start this this this. His vision because he can do what he did at Vice, but for Asians. And so he introduced me to Sean. I still remember it was Cafe Blue in K Town. And um, that was it. I met Sean and I was like, yo, I got the money. You know how to build. You did it at Vice. Let's do it together. Right. And and, and let's let's build 88. It wasn't 88 Rising at the time. It's funny enough, we were calling at the time I was calling it Rice. R Y C E. When I met with investors, they're like, "I want to build this Asian YouTube channel." I'm like, what are you talking about? What? I was like, "You heard of Vice?" And then they're like, "Yeah, Vice Media." Call it Rice. You know? like, at the time, I was like, "How much? Do you know how much Vice is worth?" They're like, five billion." I heard. I was like, "Well, we're Rice. We're Asian Vice." And then they were like, "Oh, word. Okay, here's the check." Right. So, wow. R Y C E. R Y C E. Funny enough, and then uh, later on, of course, we weren't going to call it Rice. We ended up calling it 88 Rising. Um, but, uh, that's how it all started. Wow. Um, i love to hear you talk about this more because East, East West Ventures and your idea of bridging the gaps uh, between East and West through stories and talent and entertainment. And um, you, at one point, you had this meeting talking about 88 Rising where you said, if I'm Pepsi or Coke and I want to market to kids under 21 in Shenzhen who skateboard, there's no platform for that. I thought that was really interesting for you to, for you to put it that way. And I would just love to hear more about your vision for like creating an Asian media platform to sell it. Because for many people my age in their early 20s, um, Asian culture is celebrated in all types of different ways in, in America, whether it's anime or K-pop and da 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 You can go on and on. Um, anyway... I would love to hear. Um, you know, the the basic thesis is always the same. Like 60% of the world's youth population is Asian, 
number one. Really? Yeah. We're talking about billions. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, yeah. So think about yeah, it, right? You're talking about China. In India, 1. yeah. 1.5 yeah. billion people. We're talking about India, more than 1.5 billion people, right? Then you're talking about Asia Pacific. Then you're talking about West Asia. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Asia's just the, Asians are just the biggest population of the planet, you know? Um, and so it makes zero sense to me that there isn't a media company representing Asian culture globally that can work with advertisers and brands and corporations and businesses to market to the biggest demographic with the biggest spending power in the world. Right. And so the problem is, like I said, early you know, 10 years ago, there wasn't a platform if you're Pepsi or Coke or Maybe you're, you know, <clears throat> St. Laurent and you're like, yo, I want to reach Asia. Well, who are you going to work with to co-brand and, and, and reach that demographic? There wasn't anything that was youth culture driven that was cool. Right. And, and had that elevated, you know, uh, premium quality that a brand can be like, hey, we can work with you. Right. So that was what was the original business thesis, which now you see in the U.S., if you think about any of these, you know, AAPI, Stop Asian Hate, now all these corporations have to work with Asian Americans in America, who are they thinking about working with to go reach the Asian youth? There's only one, 88 Rising, right? So that's why we do, you know, our Head in the Cloud Festival, we do our branded content. You're seeing Honda, you're seeing Johnny Walker, you're seeing... You know what I'm saying? Uh, 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 Ticketmaster, you're seeing, you know, whatever it is, right? Live Nation, all these brands work with us because they know if we're going to reach Asian youth, who's got the followers? Who's got the community? Who's got the reach? Who's cool? Who, you know, who's got, that's why MTV became MTV back in the 80s and the 90s because it had the foothold on youth culture. That's why Vice in 2010 was worth billions, not anymore, but at the time, because they had the pulse of youth culture, right? Mm-hmm. Now you're going, okay, who has the pulse of youth culture? Well, it's TikTok, right? It's 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 these other mm-hmm. sub brands, right? Supreme, whatever, if you're going to go and reach youth culture, which is the future. So we just focused on the niche, which happened to be the biggest niche in the world, Asians. And, uh, you know, sorry to say, there's just a lot more Asian people in the world than there are white people. You know, there's a lot more black people in the world. There are white people. There's a lot more brown people in the world than there are white people. Right. And so it's not just Asia, but you got to look at Africa is going to be the next big emerging market. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Right. There's also South America, Brazil, huge population. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's all happening and you just got to find your niche, build the brand and the rest will come. Yeah. That's amazing. That's I don't. I don't know. I don't know what to say. It's just so dope. So dope. Uh, very in line with with stuff that I'm already thinking about. So it's got me so enthusiastic. It's like this stuff isn't just in my head. You're communicating the same kind of stuff. It's dope. Um, I would love to just know more about like uh, what 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 you think people can can do in general between the east and the west to make things like more positive and and collaborative. Where maybe sometimes politics or things get in the way because i know you know that when it comes to entertainment and stories and things like that these are universally relatable things that people are excited about all the time and like if that makes any sense um you know i think it's all about moving the culture forward right and culture means your people right where do you come from where's your history Where's your roots? Where'd you grow up? You know, where are your parents from? Right. And everyone's passionate about their culture because it's part of their identity. Right. And it doesn't matter whether you're rich, you're poor, you're Jewish, you're African American, you're Asian American, you're Latin American, you're Native American, you're from Asia, you're from Africa, you're from Latin America, you're from the Middle East. You grow up within a culture and that becomes a part of you and that becomes a part of your identity and that is why you're proud, right? Because that's who you are. And it's not just you, 
It's most likely thousands of others and millions of others like you. So we're all the same human race, but we're the same human race made up of many different cultures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the enemy, the devil, or, you know, um, the dark side wants us to pit our cultures against each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It wants us to judge each other, misunderstand each other, hurt each other, kill each other, go to war with each other, right? And at the end, it just comes down to not understanding each other's cultures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Somehow we think my culture is better than yours, your culture. Right, right, right. Is and that's why we have race wars and racism. And, you know, now we got, you know, you know, cancel culture. And, you know, if you're not with this, then you're not with right, our right, culture. Right, 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 you're out, right, right. right. Well, then the conservatives go, you're not with our culture. You're out. Right. right, and, right, right, right. and no one's listening. Everyone's talking and everyone's imposing. But no one's mm -hmm. listening, right? You can't have a relationship without a conversation. Mm. Right? You can't have a conversation and a relationship without investing time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To understand the other person. It's the same thing with our cultures. If we don't sit across a room or sit across a dinner table or a lunch table, or a breakfast table, or drinks at a bar, and say, "Hey, tell me about how you grew up. Right, tell me right. about where you came from. Tell me about like how did you come to these conclusions of how you think and what you believe, and right. this and the third. And if we would just like listen more instead of judge a book by its cover. Oh, you're Republican, you must be Trump. Oh, you're Democrat, you must be with AOC and." whatever mm -hmm, right mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we just don't listen and take the time to humble ourselves to understand each other and so to me it really is about learning to listen learning to learn about someone else's culture and then instead of trying to judge or say i'm better go okay i understand where you're coming from, I might not agree with it, but right. I understand how you arrived here. And this is why I arrived where I'm at. And we can agree to disagree, but we can still respect one another mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and figure out ways to work together where we can and where we can't, it's okay. Right. God bless. And, and we all do what, you know, we believe, you know, we're called to do. So I think that goes across, you know, any culture, whether it's East, West, North, South, it doesn't matter. It just comes down to learning, listening, and then trying to find ways um, to find agreement where we can and to agree to not to disagree where, where we do. That's beautiful. You're right. If, if only people would take the time to try and understand something that is unfamiliar to them by, by just having a conversation with someone about how they see things rather than letting someone else tell them about how to think about someone else. You know, letting someone that's not the person they're thinking about tell them how to think about that person. And uh, I've always been one to say, let me see it for myself. Let me talk to the person for myself. The, in high school, we used to eat these uh, spicy chicken sandwiches were our favorite uh, lunch meal. And uh, this girl one time told me, there's no more chicken sandwiches. There's no more. They're all gone. And normally people would say, oh, okay. I was like, let me see for myself. Little did you know there was more spicy chicken sandwiches. So sometimes you can't take people's, you you can't just take what people are saying. You got to go see it for yourself. Um, okay. I like, that's a funny story. But uh, anyway, okay, can, can you? I was, I was last night. So uh, after, after this, do the leftovers. So, so that's funny you say that. Um, I would love to hear you talk about how you think we can. Uh, bring everybody from Web 2 and onboard them to Web 3? Because I know people have mixed feelings about Web 3. It's confusing or they think like, uh, that's, not, that's not anything worth thinking about. But obviously you believe in it a lot and I have mixed feelings about it. I go back and forth between thinking. I, I have a lot of people that I know that really believe in it, who I think are really smart people. And a lot of people I know who are really smart who aren't as invested in it. So I'd like to know what you think the uh, upside is and the potential is of onboarding everybody from web two to web three. And then exactly how do you think like we do that? Um, you know, I think 
people need to stop pitting web two versus web three, uh, almost like I'm talking about cultures, right? It's like mm. web two, web one is the internet. Web two is the internet. Web three is also the internet, mm. right? It's just an evolution of the internet, right? It's the same, we're the same species, we're all human, right? But we're evolving, right? And Web3 simply just adds a technology and a layer of the internet that allows for certain use cases that Web2 was not able to provide. And what I mean by that is uh, ownership, right? Uh, being able to own your identity, able to own your digital assets, right? Uh, being able to own your own data, um, leveraging blockchain for receipts, authentication, um, transparent records and history, mm -hmm. right? Um, digital currency, the ability to be able to transfer wealth and move money easily, quickly, more effectively and efficiently versus through the federal bank and papers pushing and, you know, all of that. And so when you think about Web3, it's, it's certain new technologies that are additional to Web2. We're not getting rid of Web2. Web2 is here to stay, meaning the technology that we're all using right now with Instagram and Facebook and Google and, and, and AWS and Google Cloud, like it's all there. Right. What I think is going to happen is we're going to see um, the two just become one. And what I mean by mm -hmm. that is it's going to be Web yep. 3 versus Web 2, which is going to be like, oh, oh, you want to send money to me, you know, with, right, 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 right. As, 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 as digital cash? Great. I don't have to actually give you real cash now. I can just send it to you, right, without three days of transfer settlements that have to go through all this paperwork in the federal bank and this and third. Great. Boom. We're not talking about web two or web three, right? If in the right, future, right, right. right, I need to, um, you know, have a digital receipt, right. Of, of, of something that I bought or I own online. And that's on a smart contract on chain. I'm not going to be asking you, when I'm buying it, yo, which chain is that on? Is it on, <laughs> is it on Cardano? Right, 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 right. Avalanche? Like, no one gives an F, <laughs> like, <laughs> what <laughs> internet protocol you're using. It's just, uh -huh, does my uh -huh. email work? <laughs> does my Facebook account work? You know right. what I'm saying? Like, people don't care about that, right? It's just these nerds in this first <laughs> Are like, yo, I'm on Team Solana. I'm on Team Avalanche. I'm on Team. <laughs> like, yo, it's just a protocol. Chill. You know what I'm saying? It's not that, ser it's not yeah, that it's serious. Just, it's not that serious. Just, just build something that works, right? Like, my mom don't care. Like, my mom got on Facebook 10 years after Facebook came out. You know what I'm saying? And so it's, it's going to be like that. Anytime you have early adoption, you're always going to get some bad players and you're going to get some good players, right? Web one blew up. Dot com, and then it was a bunch of fluff. It was like 99% mm -hmm. dot coms all went bust in 2002 and three and four. What came after that? VCs got smarter. Investors got smarter. Okay, we're not going to invest in just any dot com idea. Now we're going to invest in founders that have a proven track record that can build a real product. And then boom, what came out of 2005, six? Facebook, Twitter. You know what I'm saying? Like, Airbnb, Uber, all these companies that we know now that basically run our everyday lives. And so, again, my point is we're coming into another evolution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Recognizing, oh, there's this new technology and you're always going to have your early adopters who are going to mm -hmm. chime in and start using it. You're going to get some bad actors. So this whole NFT thing, I'll be honest, 99 percent were bad actors. Right. It's just a bunch of kids going, oh, shoot, I could just make some fast money drawing a picture of myself with my mouse, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. and, and making uh, 5,000, you know, frogs on a, on a JPEG and sell it and make a million dollars and I can just run and promise everyone I'm going to build something, but I don't. 
right? And these, they just get rugged, right? And so I think the NFT, this word NFT won't be a word that people will remember. People are not going to care 10 years from now for NFT. It's, it's like, going to be what it is. Yeah, do you know HTTP, you know, protocol? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> no one cares. It's just like, does it, does it apply to real life? Does it work? Right, 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 right. right. Does it work, right? Does your email work, right? And in many ways, the NFT is like an email. It's like, okay, does it work, right? And so, so I think, you know, there's going to be real use cases of NFTs, right? Where right. you also, like you said, you, you want a digital receipt, digital ownership, digital rewards, where now you can port from one place to another, uh, like Starbucks is doing, or Marriott Rewards. And they're saying, okay, we can use an NFT now when you buy a membership, and you can port that to our sister companies, not just within our ecosystem, other ecosystems. And that is very unique that you can't do in Web 2. You can only do in Web 3. So the way I would end this is, Think about what Web3 can do for you that Web2 can't. Look for those use cases, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then figure out how those use cases can be relevant for your life or for the product or the technology that you're building, right? But don't try to replicate Web2 and Web3. Web2 is doing just fine. Let Web2 be Web2. Let Web3 be Web3. And so, yeah. That's fascinating. That's a really interesting perspective. You just gave me the mental juice ammo uh, articulation, so to speak, to, to, to take, I'm going to be saying some, what you're saying right now to people moving forward. Cause it's like, it's just new stuff. It's new stuff that creates new possibilities to do new things, to make things more efficient. And a lot of the time early adopters end up making something seem weird to the mass audience or unapproachable because of the nature of how they adopt it as an early adopter. Because it's not mature yet. Right. It's, it's, it's not it's, it hasn't fully matured. They're just testing and trying like the all like all, every early adopter is like, what can we use this for? What's the use case? Right. You're going to get a lot of failures. Right. Majority of all startups fail. Right. Very few succeed. Right. And so it was inevitable that the first 99 percent of all these Web3 companies are going to fail. Right. But out of it. Comes the next Facebook comes the next. Google, right. 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 right? you know, whatever it might be. And it's not just blockchain, right? It's AI. It's, it's all of this that's happening mm -hmm, right now. Mm -hmm. um, that's future, right? Um, and so I'm excited. I, I think it's, you know, it's just an evolution of the internet. That's dope. That's an amazing, co very cool note to end on because it's like we're transitioning into this future. Uh, we're in this new transformational phase. So thank you so much, Jason, for taking the time. This was an incredible interview, one of the best ones yet. And uh, this was so awesome. Thank you so much. If you have any final words, closing thoughts, if you want to shout out anything, plug anything, any stuff you're working on, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. You know, everybody, you know, go and log in to open.world, O-P-3-N dot W-O-R-L-D, and try our new platform where you can use AI to create any type of comic, uh, any type of webtoon, any type of storyboard with mm. AI uh, in uh, with our platform. So it's real simple. You just put in the prompts and you can just create different strips until it becomes a full-blown comic book. Uh, you can share it with your friends. And this is just the beginning. This is one of our first uh, beta tests. We're really excited to, to bring Web3 and AI together. Um, and then we're going to be launching our super app open chat uh, later this fall in November. So get ready for it. It's going to be the platform for creators to monetize and organize uh, uh, across the world. So we're super, super excited. Um, other than that, you know, just believe in yourself. Forget the haters and uh, <laughs> keep moving forward. Nice. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap. <laughs>